Hi, and welcome to another episode of Can't Stop the Growth. I'm your host, Chad Peterman, and today we have a good friend of mine from the Chicago land area in Illinois, Midwestern guy like myself. Excited to talk to him about uh, himself his company and kind of his leadership journey as it relates to to leading his company to uh, some really, really cool things over the past couple of years. Without further ado, let's welcome Justin Carroll to the podcast. Welcome, Justin. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, awesome. Justin, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the company you're leading and uh, kind of what's brought you to kind of present day? Okay. So Perfect Home Services is a heating, air conditioning, and plumbing company. Um, I like to actually say that at Perfect Home Services, we enhance lives. It just so happens we also do heating, air conditioning, and plumbing. But uh, how did we get to where we are? A lot of ups and downs. So I started working for my dad directly out of high school. And the one thing I knew for sure at that time was I did not want to get into heating and air conditioning. That did not sound like a, uh, a good path for me. Didn't know what I wanted to do, but that wasn't it. And uh, just decided to, uh, for something to do during the summer, go to work for my dad and did that for the first summer. School time was coming up, still didn't know what I wanted to do. So there was a community college in the town that I grew up in or nearby at least that offered a, an associate's degree with HVAC as a major. My dad said, hey, if you just want to do that, I'll pay for it. You can at least start to get some classes under your belt while you figure out what you want to do with life. And I did that for a year. And then coming out of my first year of school, I knew enough about HVAC that I felt like I was ready to go out and at least try to fix something on my own. Up until that point, I had done all of the uh, less glorious jobs in the industry, uh, you know, apprentice as an install helper, duct cleaner things of that nature, go get my tools, uh, all that kind of good stuff. And after running my first call and fixing a problem for a client, something just clicked that felt really good internally. And all of a sudden, at that moment, after I fixed that first unit for the person, I realized that this was something that I could do for the rest of my life. And, and from that point forward, I guess I just stayed a bit more committed to the industry. Never finished my college degree. I, I, I was a few classes short, but found so much enjoyment in what I was doing. I just decided to stay committed to staying in the industry and working for my dad. So um, roughly around the year 2000, he started another branch of his company. His company originally started in, in uh, Peoria, Illinois started a branch in the Naperville area, which is uh, about two and a half hours north of where he was. He felt like the economy would be better in the Chicagoland area. So uh, went up and helped with that a little bit, went back and forth for a while. Uh, around 2006, he was gonna shut down the Naperville branch. It wasn't doing well. I was always pretty entrepreneurial and said, hey, if you're just gonna shut that down, I wouldn't mind taking a swing at it. He said, have at it, it's yours. So, in 06, I started a, I formed a new corporation so that we kind of had a fresh start, but um, started my own business at that time. And it was just me running around in a truck out of my town home and my wife answering the calls and doing some bookkeeping. So that's where Perfect Home Services officially began. I got into the next our organization about a year in and added plumbing about a year and a half in and, and First several years of business, we, we grew a lot and um, to be honest, probably even got a little bit cocky. Uh, after, after growing quite a bit, I, I would say we hit that wall where we're, we're about, we're getting near the $5 million revenue mark. And for a few years, it couldn't really grow past that $5 million revenue mark. And so our, our growth was definitely plateaued. Our top line sales were plateaued. Um, but our profitability dropped for about three years in a row, started losing a lot of money, couldn't really figure out what the issue was, I sat at a bankruptcy table with my wife, considered that option. That was about four or five years ago now. Had to make some really tough 
decisions at that time and face some brutal facts about myself as a leader and what needed to happen in our organization if it was going to have any chance at survival and committed to making those changes at that time. And then pretty much every day since that rock bottom moment, we've gotten a little bit better every day. I like to say, you know, three or four steps forward and one step back every day. And so since that, since that point in time, um, we've, we've really become a, a fairly good company. Whereas when I look back, I'd say we, we weren't such a great company prior to that rock bottom moment. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, tell, uh, if you don't mind, tell the audience, I think you're, you're maybe, uh, I'm, I know you decently well here uh, now. I think you're maybe not giving yourself enough credit. Where, uh, where, how, where is, what's your company look like today after what you said, you know, five years ago or so sitting at a, at a bankruptcy table? What, what, what does it look like today? What's Perfect Home Services look like? So at that moment, we were probably uh, roughly b- between four and a half and five million in revenue with you know negative net profit. Today, we've got uh, over a hundred employees and we're on pace to do somewhere in the neighborhood of about 25 million in annual revenue with uh, a really healthy profit line. And most importantly, on top of it all, I'd say, we've probably got the most engaged and happy team than we've ever had in the history of the company. So we're in a pretty good place today. I'm I'm happy with where we are, but we've still got plenty of room for growth and improvement still. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the reason why I love doing the podcast is you learn so much, even, you know, you and I have known each other probably for a little over a year now. I had no idea about any of that. So uh, not like that's the first thing you just rattle off when you meet someone new. Hey, let me tell you my origin story, if you don't (laughs) mind. Um, So uh, fascinating stuff there. Um, One of the things I'd like to kind of hit on is I think something that if you're in our industry is always, you know, somewhat of a mystery. How do you go from you know, kind of that technician mentality to growing a company um, like that, that, that you've created. Um, obviously, there's some leadership challenges along the way. What, what would you say were some of those maybe hurdles or that you had to overcome as you kind of grew, maybe had some employees and things start to get bigger? What, what would you say uh, were some of those things that, that you had to overcome along your journey? Well, I mean, in order to grow, I think at first you have to want to grow. There, there's got to be some intentionality there. I'm sure there are people out there today, and I've, I've met them, that are perfectly happy with where they are, and, and they're not very interested in, in growing much larger than wherever they are today. And so if you don't have the interest or intention to grow, then you're certainly not going to grow. But if you are a leader with the intention to grow any organization. That's where it begins. I think you need to set some goals and know where you want to go. And then I I do believe that one of the most important pieces to growth is quality leadership. And that leadership does start at the top and it trickles its way down to have a a larger organization, you can't just have one strong leader, you've got to have a lot of strong leaders. And so in order to grow your company, you've got to be constantly growing your leaders and growing yourself as a leader. I believe every organization is limited by its level of leadership. So the higher level of leadership within the organization, the higher potential for growth and capability for growth that exists. You know, what What were some of my personal challenges that I faced? I would say for sure I was far too selfish in the beginning. Uh, to be quite honest, when I first started the business, I think the why, the mission behind it all, truthfully, if I were to be totally candid with everyone, would be just to become wealthy personally. And that's a, that's a very selfish mission. And to be quite honest, it doesn't even feel good in that chair in the end. I I don't, I today now believe that money, 
truly does not bring happiness. It certainly is a helpful means to an end, but but money in itself and anything that it buys won't, won't entirely bring happiness. And any mission that doesn't involve others, that any selfish missions are unpure and are doomed to fail. So, yeah. you know, I think it's important that uh, I, I need I needed to first learn to really truly care about others before my business could could really start to flourish. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you you hit on a few key things there. You know, you talked about you know the 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 organization will lot rise to the level of leadership, uh, similar to Maxwell's concept of of kind of the law of the lid, um, and, and something that we talk about a lot here in the building is you know regardless of what your position is, we all need to be growing as leaders uh, each and every day, because if someone on your team is growing and you as the, the, you know, supposed leader aren't growing, well, then you're going to have a, you're going to have an issue uh, at some point in time. So we've always got to be improving, always got to be continuing to grow. What are those? Obviously you, you've grown some leaders there in house and, and you mentioned kind of the happiness of the organization. What would you say are some of those things that you guys try to do uh, internally or maybe resources externally that you point your people to that you've seen uh, be effective in, in their leadership growth? So one of, the, one of the many things we do through our one-on-one -on -one process is we often do talk about any observations we're making that may be preventing an individual from being the best leader that they can be. It's a conversation we have often there. One thing that's very impactful, I think for myself and all the other leaders in the organization is we do have a leadership training that we do once a week, every week, it's Thursday mornings. And anyone in the entire company is invited to attend that. And I also tell people, you don't have to want to necessarily be in a leadership position in order to attend this because I believe that being a great leader is pretty much the same thing as being a great human being. They're pretty much one and the same. And so anyone who just wants to grow as a human, I strongly encourage them to attend this leadership training. So with a little over hundred people in the company, I think we've got roughly about 30 people that attend that optional leadership training. So we've got about 30% participation, which I think is good. And that's just as good for me as it is everyone else. I mean, we tend to get better at the things that we talk about on a regular basis, right? And and that conversations, the conversations we have in there, they're very, they're very fluid. We just go with the flow. Anything you want to bring up, any questions you want to ask, it's 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 just very open. And I do believe I continue to grow as a leader through those conversations and also we're helping to achieve our mission through this as well. I mean, our, our mission as a company is to enhance the lives of the families that we impact. So we're constantly talking about enhancing lives. And I believe this is one of the many things that we do in order to accomplish that end result. I think, I think that leadership training is massively impactful for everybody who participates. Yeah, absolutely. I could not agree more. You know, one of our core values here at uh, at Peterman is lead yourself. I think that goes along with, you know, kind of becoming a better human. You know, we're all called to to serve others. Some call it leadership. Uh, others call it, you know, just being a good person. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot of times the one and the same. And people look to put kind of a label on leadership as well. That's some I don't do that. You know, I'm I'm just an individual contributor. Or, and and the the truth of it is is we're all doing that every day by our our, our words and our actions. And and, and that's uh, how we impact the world, or as you say, you know, enhance the lives uh, of our customers. So I think that's just a huge thing. One of the things I've noticed in in kind of our leadership endeavors, and, and you kind of spoke to it but uh, I would like to kind of see if you can elaborate on it a little bit for the listeners is what impact do you think that you talking about leadership, you having these leadership classes on a weekly basis, what impact do you think that that's made on your culture uh, throughout the company? I, I probably don't even 
fully understand the value that it brings. And still knowing that, I would say, I think it's uh, immensely impactful. As I said earlier, in order to grow an organization, you have to grow your people. And I think we're growing people in a way that's very pure. Um, most of our conversations are more wrapped around uh, doing the right thing and being a good person and caring. And, and all those people who are participating are getting a little bit better every single week at becoming better humans, which by the way, is also becoming a better leader. And we've got people in pretty much a, a few people or a percentage of people from every single department in the entire company involved in this training. And so anytime they do notice something getting out of place, uh, those people can then jump in, step in, be a leader in that scenario and say, hey, you know, that's that's not really what we do here. That's not really what we've signed up for here. Or they can jump in and be a leader, even though they're not a leader, which, you know, I think the small things are the big things. So those things some of those conversations that sometimes happen in companies back by the dumpster at the water cooler um, where things start to go sideways. I think those conversations are conversations that can eat an organization alive. And knowing that I've got people who are totally bought into the vision and, and, and are committed to the idea of being great leaders and great people can help us in scenarios like that where, where some of those conversations aren't always the most productive conversations that can happen, but I could probably go on and on, but I, I see immense value in what we're doing there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, from my personal experience, it's, it's one of those when you, when you take your organization and make that a focus of people just getting better, uh, as, as you said, it, it, you know, three or four steps forward, one step back, um, mistakes are going to happen, uh, challenges are going to arise, but um, what is it that we're doing to get a little bit better today um, that we can carry on over into the next day, I think is, is, is definitely a critical piece um, to it, really any company's journey um, in growth. So you, could, yep. you could take that and turn that into a math equation to really understand the value. I think many humans, we, you know, we kind of like, naturally, a lot of us want that you know, get rich quick idea, or we wish we could just take a pill and, and, you know, be in the perfect physical condition we want to, or, and, and it, it can be discouraging to think about the idea of, man, I'm, I'm here right now. And I want to be way up here. Holy cow. The amount of work I'd have to do to get there is just discouraging. You know, it's like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? How do you grow one day at a time? turn that into a math equation real quick. If we legitimately say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get three steps better one every day and one step back. Okay. So I'm going to move, I'm going to move my needle two inches every single day. Okay. Well, there's 365 days in a year. And even if you only count work days to that, do that math and let me know where you started at the beginning of the year and where you ended at the beginning of the year and how much better you are just, just in a month or in a year's investment of time you can make a massive difference by just doing a little bit at a time. And I think it's easier to bite it off that way. And, and so what's the mindset you've got to take on in order to accomplish that? Just grow a little bit every day. Just, just, give, me, just give me one inch every day, one inch of growth. That's it. And we're going to be 365 inches taller at the end of the year. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, uh, I think some people maybe underestimate the power of momentum because once you get to 20 inches of growth, uh, 21 and 22 and 30 and 40 and 50, they become a heck of a lot easier because you've created that momentum uh, that's going to carry you. Uh, those first few steps are tough. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get to like step 14. Okay, that's getting even a little bit tougher because yeah, I've created a little bit of momentum, but not enough to you know be sustainable. But it's when you break through um, that that wall is is when you really start rolling. Um, I think that's any workout program I've ever tried. I got to mm -hmm. get going for about a about a month straight, not missing a day, and then you start to it becomes addicting. So yeah, or or it's that one day that you take off that just 
destroys your entire progress. And then one day turns into two days. Now you've got negative momentum in the wrong direction. Yep. 100%. Um, it, you said something earlier that I wanted to uh, touch on and, and we got uh, going down a different path, but you, uh, you mentioned one-on-ones. Um, what role uh, did the one-on-ones play in your organization as it relates to kind of your leaders and, and them connecting with those that they're leading? So I, I do believe that one-on-ones are a very critical piece to success. And this was something that Jack Tester helped me to understand after we climbed out of our, you know, our bankruptcy hole and started to get a little bit of momentum behind us and progress behind us. I reached out to uh, Jack Tester, who is the uh, prior president of Nexstar, And I just asked him, I said, Hey, I feel like I'm making a little bit of progress here. I've always looked up to you as a leader. What do you think I could do better or differently to continue to grow as a leader? Very random out of nowhere. Just, just reached out to him and asked him that question. And he just asked me a few questions about what things we were and weren't doing. And he urged me to get very serious about some of the meeting flows in the business, including, you know, the the company-wide meetings, the one-on-ones, the level 10 meetings, the huddles. And I followed him with blind faith and what he suggested. And I'm so thankful that I did. So one-on-ones in particular, I think the most important part of a one-on-one is making sure we check in with people and finding out how they're doing. And all of our one-on-ones start with that question, how are you? And I train all of my direct reports to do that one-on-one and ask that question in a way where you absolutely mean it. This isn't that, how are you that we ask when we meet a stranger walking down the road This is legitimately, how are you? And look and listen, watch body language. If someone says, okay, or or anything below that, all right, we've got a problem here. Let's dig into this. Um, So we need to be looking at body language. We need to be asking that question and truly caring to understand. And if things are good, let's find out why they're good. What motivates this person? What makes them happy? If things aren't so good, let's find out why and let's ask the question, how can we apply our mission to this? How can we help to enhance this person's life? Maybe they're having trouble at home um, or having a hard time you know, achieving their goals. What resources do we currently have that we can provide to them or how can we get creative to help them to get into that place of good? So. To me, if that's all we accomplish in the one-on-one, I'm happy. I, I, I think there are plenty of other conversations we can have in that one-on-one, but that to me is definitely the most critical conversation. And in doing so, you know, you go back to seven habits, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People start to, to truly realize that they work in a place where people, where they're truly cared for and that's one of the things we do, I think, to help uh, improve our culture and to keep our finger on the pulse of things and also to uh, use it as an op- opportunity to truly enhance lives. Yeah, uh, you, you said a lot of great things there. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that, that I'm a firm believer in is that uh, much like you said there at the end is, you know, uh, is, is care. Oftentimes people can get caught up in leadership and where I'm supposed to, you know, they, they confuse it with, well, I'm just going to tell everybody what to do. We're at the end of the day, whether it's enhancing lives, like you say, or, you know, what I, I like to kind of refer to it, which is the same thing, just different word is, is, you know, we're called as leaders to inspire. Um, and it, it's very difficult to inspire and or enhance someone's life if they don't know that you care. Honestly, if you don't care. Um, and so I, I see managers oftentimes fail and it's like, do you know anybody like on your team outside of their name, um, and what they do? Do you know anything about them? Do you know about their family? Do you know about what they're struggling with? Do you know about maybe a home life situation? You know, one of the big ones for us being a younger team is, is people having kids and it's like, yeah, that's exhausting. Like if you're coming to work and you know, you're having a tough time, like, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I got a newborn at home or, Hey, I've got a, you know, two-year-old that's running around the house. Like 
I feel that I, I get your pain. Uh, you know, sometimes it's tough to get them to go to bed. Um, but if you don't know that about your team, it's, it's very difficult to relate um, on any sort of level. And that's just relationships in general, it seems. But I feel like when you get in the workplace, that can often get lost because it's like, well, leave your personal life at home. What are kind of your thoughts on that as far as kind of your culture and and leadership style? Are you more, hey, business is business and leave your personal life at home? Do you intermix? Or what, what do you guys kind of at, at, at Perfect Home Services, what do you guys, what, what's kind of your culture look like on, on that front? I would say there, there's a lot of room for information about personal life here. And ultimately we are constantly either looking for opportunities to celebrate good things that are happening in people's lives or find ways to help people with things that are happening in their lives. if not so good things are happening. And the only way you're going to be able to do that or know that is if, if you're talking about that, I would say it's never an expectation that someone shares what's going on in their personal life. But I would also at the same time say that because of the culture that we have, it's extremely seldom that someone's pretty closed off about what they've got going on at home. I tend, I tend to be uh, very transparent in all areas of life with all people in life. And I think a lot of stuff comes from the top down. However you are as the leader of the organization probably transfers into your business's culture. But a fair amount of personal information is, is usually offered and certainly allowed yeah, within the organization. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, I, I think um, I feel like kind of the just companies in general are, are kind of made that shift uh, where it used to be, you know, hey, leave your personal life at home. It's like, who in their right mind can do that? Like, mm -hmm. if you got stuff going on, you got stuff going on. How can we how can we how can we help you? What do, what do you see as some of the hurdles that you may have newer managers uh, that you're seeing them having to try to overcome? What, what are some of those things that, you know, uh, are, I guess you, for lack of a better term, kind of the pitfalls that you see younger leaders and not even younger, but just newer managers um, seeing them go through that could, uh, you know, for the listeners could be kind of a, you know, red flag of, hey, oh, I see myself doing this, or hey, someone else is doing this. Where, where do you kind of see that from your perspective? So I don't know if it's one particular thing for all people. Um, I think typically when somebody comes into a new leadership position, whether whether this they're just, they've got leadership experience from a prior company and they're coming here, or this is their first leadership position ever, I think we're all wired differently and we all have different strengths and weaknesses. So I do believe it varies from one person to the next, but if you were to look for common threads, some of the things that I think would be maybe some of the more common pitfalls uh, would be one thing. I think, I think more often than not, people struggle with candid communication. They have a really hard time sharing the concerns that they see with other people and also doing it in a way, sharing that information in a way that's productive. I think most organizations on the planet could greatly benefit from being more candid with one another. And we have a guiding principle that speaks to how we would hope that they do that. It's see it, say it directly and with respect. That's stolen from Nexstar. And I, I feel like that's something that a lot of leaders, especially newer leaders, struggle with. I think they tend to, to be more worried about maybe being friends with other people or I think in general, society and culture says, you know, hey, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And I think that's hugely detrimental to any group or organization. I think people need to know candidly where they stand, how they're doing, what they could do better or differently. And we need to deliver that information with tact. And I've, I've always said that, you know, you could say something to someone in a way that gets you punched in the face and you could say the very same thing in a different way. It gets you a hug at the end. And so, you know, 
letting people know exactly what they're doing that you really appreciate that is going well. And then also letting them know what, know what you see that they could be doing better or differently as quickly as possible in a private environment, praise in public, you know, talk about concerns in private. Uh, but I, I think that is the one thing that could make the largest difference is people, leaders, newer leaders especially, could deliver their praise often and concerns in private, openly and candidly with tact. That would be the one thing if I had to choose one thing. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's, uh, you know, I always when I hear people, you know, complaining about someone they manage, like, oh, is he ever going to figure this out? Or why can't he figure, why can't he do this process right? And, you know, my question is to them always is, well, do they know that? Well, uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Well, okay. Well, what, do we think we're going to solve anything by us talking about it? Uh, or maybe we should have it, you know, sit down, have a conversation um, about what it is that is, is going on. And I would say that that's one thing I struggle, struggle with myself is, you know, have those, they're tough conversation. It, no one wants to have them. If you had to do anything, you know, if you gave me a list of things to do today, having a, a tough conversation with somebody is not going to rank near the top. But I think if you ranked them in order of productive, it's probably going to be the most productive thing that you do. You no, know, all no day question. long. I, I, I'll, I'll try not to go too far down a rabbit hole here, but I remember back when I started my business, I was, it, it might be fair to say, deathly afraid of tough conversations or really any kind of conversation where I had to tell someone about something that I was observing that I didn't feel was good. You know, it, I don't care what it was. Asking someone to change or improve in any way was extremely uncomfortable for me. Fast forward to today, and there is almost no discomfort whatsoever in that conversation. And it's, it's wild how much I've transformed in that way. And I think what did it for me, and I don't know that really this is something that everybody can necessarily apply, but when I hit that rock bottom moment in my company, that was one of the things that I was sure was holding us back from a greater level of success. I know I knew there were a ton of people within my organization that I needed to, to have some tough conversations with, or what I would call tough conversations at that time, and I was not having those conversations. And that was playing a huge role in our failure. And so how did I get from there to here to where I am today? I've had this conversation with a few different people recently. I think our brain does something uh, uh, weird, especially when we, when we experience some level of tragedy in our life or this rock bottom moment, as I'll call it. My brain now associates all of those habits that I've identified as poor leadership habits. My brain now associates those things with that pain. So, Anytime I get remotely close to, to one of those habits that I, I recognized at that time as being habits that, that landed us in that really negative position, my brain says, you stay the heck away from that. That's trouble. That's, that's that pain that we went through. Don't you ever go anywhere near there again. And so now I've got like this intense drive from within to never go anywhere remotely close to some of those habits that were, that that I view that my brain views as creating all that pain, and I unfortunately I don't know how you recreate that, but I believe that that's how I was able to make some of the changes I needed to make, and how I how I stay light years away from any of those poor habits now today, it's because my brain just associates those things with pain. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, uh, we think about the things that we don't do anymore or habits that we have, and it's it's like a result of a bad situation. And oh, well, we don't want to do that again. You know, when do we learn the most? It's when we fail at something. Uh, hey, we don't want to do that again. 
So uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people on that uh, on that very same journey. You know, you mentioned Jack Tester, one of the books, and and I heard him teach on it was Crucial Conversations, um, which uh, you know if you're if you're having trouble with these conversations that book is a fantastic one because it literally, and I will admit I have used the template in there. Uh, it gives you a template on, it's literally a fill in the blank template on how to have a tough conversation with someone. But uh, as you've said a couple of times, deliver it with tact and to get a result as opposed to just going in and you know chastising somebody. Um, it, it, it's a really good resource for, for anybody out there going through that same thing, for sure. And one of the things I've learned is after you get good at those conversations, honestly, you tend, you tend to get more hugs and handshakes and fist bumps at the end of these conversations that you thought were gonna be, maybe you thought there it was gonna turn into a screaming match. I don't know, what are those things you're envisioning in your mind before you go into this tough conversation? And the more you do it, the better you get at it. And, and in the end, what I've come to learn today is almost every time I sit down for one of those tough conversations now, I'm being thanked at the end of the conversation. I'm getting a hug, I'm getting a handshake, I'm getting a fist bump and like, thank you for sharing that with me. I appreciate it. This has been really helpful. So it, it actually, it's one of many things that I do believe helps to improve a culture in an organization, although if you were to just think about it, I think it's counterintuitive to believe that having conversations like that are going to make your organization better. And I believe 100% that they have a massive impact in improving an organization. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think, I think it speaks to what you said earlier about leadership. I mean, if you practice it, if you encourage people to do it, it becomes commonplace in your organization. People are talking about leadership. Well, if you make crucial conversations commonplace in your organization if you from a leadership perspective are leading the charge in yeah i'm not afraid to have these they're productive you know yeah it's not my my top of my priority list but yeah i know i need to have them for the organization to be healthy um you are going to leave with those fist bumps and hugs and stuff like that because people know it's okay it's not you getting mad at anybody it's you trying to help them um which i think is is critical um, in that a tough conversation is not meant to point out a flaw. It's to bring awareness to an area where someone could, where someone could improve. You, you said something that I think deserves some attention. You said it's not on the top of my priority list. I, I agree 100%. Our, our brain, I, I steal this phrase from Dan Fries, and our brains are fantastic liars. Our brain lies to us constantly. It tries to protect our ego. It, it tries to help us to stay more comfortable. I that is one thing I see often in many managers is we purpose, we, we subconsciously make this a lower priority when this should be our top priority. When something is going on that doesn't align with what we've, what we've committed to or, you know, or, the processes that we've committed to, the core values, the guiding principles, the mission, there is no other priority above that priority. We've got to have that conversation as quickly as possible. And what I see happen very often is we rationalize lowering the priority of the conversation and it never happens. We say, oh, you know, he's, he's out on a call right now and I'll just let him finish up this call and and then all of a sudden it gets done with that call and you're busy and you're on the phone and it's like, oh, you know what? That next call looks like a tough one. We better get into that one. I'll do it at the end of the day. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put them in a bad mood for the rest of the day. And then the end of the day comes and oh, I got tied up. I'll hit it in our one-on-one. -on -one. I'll see him in a couple of days in the one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one comes and then it's now it's like, oh, well, you know, so much time has passed. I'm not even going to bring this up. This is too old. It's our brain trying to, trying to, trying to prevent us from having to get into that uncomfortable position. I have had this conversation so many times with so many leaders and managers. It's, hey, when it pops up, we need to have the conversation right now. Not, I mean, if, if, if let's say it's a person that's in the field, okay, let them finish that one call, but no more than that. Don't interrupt that person in the middle of a call. 
but absolutely, if it's a field person, we're, we're having that conversation as quickly as possible. And that has an enormous impact for so many reasons, but we don't need to go too much deeper down that rabbit hole. No, yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's perfect. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I can even think of times myself where I've done that, I like, literally like verbatim, uh, what you Same. just depicted out. <laughs> it's like, uh oh, yep, yep, he's hitting a nerve here. Uh, <laughs> this is this is definitely something that I have uh, I have partaken in uh, with the uh, I can make up the excuses with the best of them of why we can't have that conversation. Um, you know, even some made up, uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's somewhat crazy, but, and I think too, is coming from the right place, right. Is, you know, you can't have a critical conversation if your intent is to, you know, like poke fun at somebody or, you know, to chastise them. It's gotta be to help them. Uh, like I need to have this conversation because if I don't, you're going to continue down the wrong path and you're not going to be successful. And, and that's leadership. That's service to others is to bring it to their attention um, as to what they could do to get better um, and what you're observing from the outside. Uh, I think that's just extremely, extremely critical. You just scratched the surface on, on probably one of my greatest challenges as a human in life that I consistently work on and focus on in all areas of my life, this is the one thing of all things that I feel like I need to get a lot better at. And that is excluding negative emotion from any conversation that I have. We need to have all conversations with all people in life through, through a filter of, or a paradigm of wisdom and knowledge. And when we bring negative emotion into any conversation we're having that conversation is doomed to fail and it's extremely difficult to do it is so easy for me to sit here and say that this is just what we need to do but try it i mean any something happens you don't like what happened it could be your wife your kids your friend someone you work with in an organization someone you're leading they do something that bothers you, hurts you in some way, shape or form, irritates you. I've told this guy this three different times or <laughs> how many times I got to tell him or something they did or said really hurt you. And when we approach that conversation, we're not approaching it with wisdom and knowledge. We're bringing negative emotion. We're, we're kind of blaming them. And those conversations never end well when we bring our negative emotion to the scenario. So that is something I have legitimately been working on for well over five years now. And I've made progress and it's still immensely difficult to leave negative emotion out of conversations and just come with complete wisdom and knowledge. And that, that negative emotion shows itself in your tone of voice, in your body language, in the words you choose to use in every form of your communication to the person you're having that conversation with. And it's massively impactful to the outcome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I think that that is a, a definitely a key takeaway um, that any listener can take to any conversation that, that they need to you know, have you know, on your priority list. Uh, for everybody, you can probably find a couple of key conversations that you need to have. Um, but you haven't had yet. So um, I think, uh, you know, to Justin's point is have the conversation like now, uh, like don't wait or else, you know, it, it can, you're not going to get the desired result uh, that you need because uh, you're going to continue to push it, push it off and, and, and let it fester. What, um, you know, I, I, it kind of coming full circle here as we kind of uh, look to, to wrap up and um, finish out uh, at this episode that you provided us with some, some great uh, takeaways on, you know, kind of circling back to kind of that journey to where you are um, now. What would be that one thing that obviously, you know, you started it off you had kind of the pitfall to where it got and then have brought that back out of there. What do you think? Well, I, if I asked you, I, I could probably guess the answer of like, Hey, I'm glad I experienced that. It's taught me a ton. 
what would you tell your younger self, that guy who's running around in a truck running calls and the, you know, the wife's doing the bookkeeping at home? What would you tell that person today, knowing what you know? Uh, what would you tell them to stay focused on if you, if you could say something to that, to that version of yourself? I just had to pick one thing. It, it really would be caring about people. I think it all starts there. I mean, I, I don't believe there's one silver bullet in anything, and especially in business or leadership, but where does it all begin in truly caring about people? That's, that's, that's what I wish I did better in the beginning. I wish, I wish I were a lot less selfish in the beginning. Yeah. But I think that that's an easy, you know, to, to your credit, I mean, that's got to be an easy thing to fall in, especially when you're a one man show. I mean, who else are you to care about? You know what I mean? I mean, there, you've got to, you got to uh, look out for yourself. And, you know, I remember my dad's stories of, you know, I knew what my bills were for the week and I knew how much I had to make. There wasn't a whole lot of, you know, caring for other, I mean, obviously cared about his customers, but, you know, it's easy to, to always stay in that, in that frame of mind. But yeah, I mean, your, your care is obviously, you don't have over a hundred team members without caring about people because people can find another place to work, especially nowadays. Uh, you know, they're hiring at Taco Bell for like $19 an hour or some crazy stuff like that around the, around the corner. You can always find a job. Um, so it's, it's creating that organization that people want to come, want to create that career, uh, want to be better versions of themselves at. Uh, so I think you're, you're doing a, a very commendable job uh, as it relates to, to building your company there. I guess a few questions to finish out just because uh, I've learned a ton, um, probably brought up some, uh, some, some areas that I need to uh, address here quickly. But um, as we finish out, what, uh, you know, I'm a big, big proponent of kind of leading yourself and, and, and what, uh, what you do as a leader and, and the success that you've achieved. What does, uh, what's kind of your morning routine look like? What, what is that as you prepare yourself for kind of your leadership journey each and every day? What, do, what does that look like for you? So just to kind of share some things that you may do that others could, could potentially do as well. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of morning routines. I'll, I'll be honest and say that I'm not 100% consistent in my morning routine. I'm maybe 70% consistent in my morning routine. And in the event I make the choice to cut it short in some way, there are some things that I tend to prioritize more than others. But um, on a perfect day, uh, today I, I executed my entire morning routine. I start with uh, prayer, talk to, talk to God for a little bit. And then um, I, there's a book uh, by Hal Elrod called uh, The Miracle Morning. And I've essentially just applied what he teaches in that book. Uh, there's an acronym called SAVERS that he suggests. He suggests that you slam a, a glass of water first thing when you wake up. You never hit the alarm clock for any reason whatsoever. Uh, always when that alarm clock goes off, you jump up immediately, never hit the snooze, chug a glass of water that gets your metabolism going and it, it wakes you up, uh, brush your teeth. So you feel fresh and ready to start your day. And then he goes into this acronym, uh, savers, uh, S stands for silence. So I do some form of meditation at that point. I may use the breathe app on my, on my watch, or I may use headspace to do some meditation. I kind of change it up. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I do slide my prayer in before I even do the meditation piece or the breathing piece. So that's that's your uh, that's your S for savers. The A is affirmations. So I tell myself who I'm committed to be. Um, you know, I am courageous. I am a great father. I am a great husband. All of these things, right? And I get a lot more specific than that. Um, V stands for visualization. So you visualize yourself for a couple minutes being that person who you've committed to be. You imagine your life as that person for, for a few moments. Uh, e is exercise. R is, um, oh, 
R is reading, so read for 10 minutes, and then S is scribing. So just have a little journal. The, the scribing piece is just write anything that's on your mind for a few minutes. Um, that's the perfect morning routine for me. When I cut it short, I usually cut it short after the exercise. Um, I leave off sometimes the reading or the scribing. One reason I feel comfortable cutting off the reading is I, I know that chances are on the way to and from work, I'm, I'm listening to an audio book anyway, so I'm getting my reading in at that time. Yeah, awesome. That's uh, great stuff. And, and I think that the biggest takeaway, and let me know if you agree, is, you know, is just preparing ourselves. I feel like so many people wake up and expect to be great without any preparation whatsoever. It's like, you woke up late, you didn't have any breakfast, like, well, how are you going to perform? Um, you know, you don't go into an athletic event without stretching. Uh, it, it, this is very similar to that. Like you have to prepare yourself to perform at a high level. I don't, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts as, as far as that goes? Absolutely. Well, let's just start with the first piece. Never, never hit the snooze button. What are, you, what are you saying without saying it when you hit your snooze button? You're saying, okay, I set a goal for today. And the very first thing I did today, I set a goal to get up at 5 a.m. I, I chose to give up on my goal. The minute, I, the minute my alarm clock went off today, I, I chose to fail. First thing, right, right out of the gate. What kind of momentum do we have going into our day today now? <laughs> I've given, I love up, that. I've given up the minute I started. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I gave a talk uh, last week and I said, uh, you know, the biggest th key takeaway I said was, you know, don't fool yourself. No one on earth is a morning person. You choose to wake up in the morning. No one wakes up, like, unless you're sleeping on the ground uh, and it's uncomfortable, uh, most of us have a decently comfortable bed. It is comfortable to sleep, uh, especially when you've been asleep. Uh, waking up is on no one's like, you know what? Yes, this sounds a hell of a lot better than turning over and continuing to sleep in this comfortable bed. Uh, it, it's a choice that you make. It's your, it's your intentionality uh, with which you wake up is, with, is what you'll be throughout that day. Um, you know, I, I, that goes along with those affirmations and, and things of that nature. So I appreciate you sharing that. That's awesome stuff. And the word uh, you've used is a word I love to use too, intentionality. I mean, it's so wild how, how powerful intentionality is in life. I think it, I, it, it aligns that I, the idea of intentionality, I feel aligns a lot with kind of the law of attraction. If, if you buy into that concept and there are, I know I'll, I'll hit another quick point. There are some people who don't like the law of attraction or the secret. If, if you've ever read that book or documentary and they say, well, I don't like it because it doesn't give credit to God. Well, I just, in, in my book, I do believe in God. And I just say, God created that law. The, the, and, and so I'm good with it. I believe in it, whether it be the law of attraction or intentionality, I, I fully believe when you focus on things, there's a, and you seriously fully focus on something, there's a very strong chance you're going to achieve it. And if you're wandering aimlessly through life, well, there's a pretty good chance you're going to achieve that too. No doubt. Uh, no doubt for sure. Well, as we, uh, as, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, and again, I can't thank you enough for your time and, and spending a little bit of it with us as we talk about leadership and, and hopefully, you know, inspire others uh, through kind of some of the stuff that you've went through and um, had to uh, battle against and some of the stuff that you've seen as your, as your company's uh, seen uh, really tremendous success. If there's one thing that you would leave uh, the listeners with uh, as it relates to leadership, what would you, what would you leave them as we close out today with? You know, I, I guess, Man, there's so much. I mean, I could go on for hours, but I guess if you're to keep it pretty simple and concise, just keep growing, try to grow, try to grow at least one inch every single day. There are endless resources out there to do that. If you're intentional about it and you really truly want to grow and you're committed to growing, there are endless 
resources for you. There are a ton of great books, The Seven Habits, 24, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, Extreme Ownership, Good to Great are some of my favorites. There are great podcasts out there. There's yours, there's John Maxwell's, Andy Stanley's, um, endless resources everywhere for you to continue to grow as a leader. Just be intentional, take the time to do it, and you will. Um, culture is rocket fuel. Spend time and energy paying attention to, keeping your finger on the pulse of your culture. And again, like everything else, just like you're growing as a leader, try to grow your culture one inch every day. And culture is probably the one thing that I would say is the closest to a silver bullet as a leader. When you've got a great culture within your team or your group, um, you're driving a speedboat. And, and if you need to turn, you need to adjust. Well, we constantly need to turn and adjust. It, we're, we're in an ever-changing world. Our, our world is changing faster than it's probably ever changed before as a result of technology. If you're, not, if you're not changing fast, you're getting left behind. And in order to be able to change fast and turn fast like a speedboat can, you've got to have great culture. People have to feel like they, they're in an organization that cares about them. And so um, I, could, I could just keep going, but I'll, I'll stop for sake of time. No, you're good. Those are all uh, all great, great points. You know, you, you touched on it there at the end, the, the culture piece, I would 100% agree with you. Uh, when you start working on your culture, and it's not, a, it's not a ping pong table, it's not a napping pod, it's not what people would commonly associate with culture. Culture is something you work on every day. And in my mind, it starts with the care that you show your people. Um, and when you show that care, it, it spreads like wildfire and you indeed will be driving uh, that speedboat because creating that culture of care, it, it has a compound effect, uh, which often results in a heck of a lot of growth. So again, Justin, can't thank you enough uh, for joining us on the podcast today. A uh, ton of wisdom there as it relates to leadership and, and growing a company and, and, and growing leaders. Um, I'm excited for our listeners to hear this, I'm excited for what they may take from it. And, and uh, you no doubt enhanced uh, the, the lives of the listeners today with your story. So for all our listeners out there, uh, excited for you to hear this, uh, excited for you to take some things from this. And uh, as we always say um, on the podcast, keep growing out there. And until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks a lot. Bye.